I want to talk now about land animal hunting, but before I do that, that reminds me that I missed a point that I wanted to say earlier on about fish traps, fish weirs. Um, it's been said by Alan Boris, and I agree with him, that fish weirs, in a sense, are um, a very Athabascan sort of approach to hunting, or to fish fishing. Uh, what I think he's getting at there is that for things like caribou, um, many of the Athabascan groups had ways of sort of trapping caribou in, um, in different ways, such as the famous Gwich'in caribou fences, which could stretch for miles and are these uh, sorts of wooden structures um, stre from trees and different things and snares that you stretch over up to like half a mile, kind of funnel caribou into it where you can then more easily hunt them or trap and snare them. So fishing weir is sort of a very similar logic, but applied to a salmon instead of a caribou. So it's interesting to see the ways in which people's cultural traditions, we can draw these connections and say, you know, is that sort of a connection there, sort of a certain way of thinking about how you harvest an animal, just applying it to a very different kind of animal, sort of cultural continuity, even when you're moving into a totally different kind of thing. But in any case, land animals, uh, as the example I just gave suggests, for many of the northern Athabascan groups, um, such as Koyukon, Han, Gwich'in, many others, um, Tanana, Tanakras, land animals are hugely significant, uh, hunting land animals, obviously, and although the Denaina groups, other than inland Denaina communities, most of the Denaina groups had access to pretty extensive um, aquatic resources, and also the inland groups, but just to a lesser degree, anyways. Although, since most of the Denaina people had access to a lot of aquatic animals, that shouldn't ignore the fact, though, that people did do a lot of land hunting, even if it was less significant uh, than it might have been for some other groups. So, and it was definitely more significant depending on which kind of village you were in. It's interesting to note that people a lot of times used different kinds of traps, as was talked about in the reading, such as deadfall traps. I have a replica of one in my office. It's not actually an original deadfall trap. It's just one that a student made a replica of. Um, but really, really creative way to get at these animals, right? Done in a number of different cultures, but this way it sort of hits the beam and then the whole thing falls on the animal and crushes it dead, as well as other kinds of deadfall traps and different kinds of traps as well. Um, pit traps, pitfall traps where you'd have a pit that um, they'd fall onto kind of different kinds of material to injure them and then you could kill them. Um, all sorts of different ways of getting at these animals other than just going around and directly hunting them. People did also go out and directly hunt by spearing and or um, bow hunting animals. So, for example, um, using a bow and arrow on a caribou and then coming up and spearing it as kind of the coup de gras. People would oftentimes go out in hunting parties, um, several men together, and then, and as the reading suggested, an older male would come along to tell stories and things, uh, and also help with the cooking. It's, I think, a fascinating sort of integration of elders in, where they still are serving a really important purpose in the hunting party, um, rather than the way in which some societies sort of just write off elders and what they can contribute to the um life of a society's subsistence. In this way, they're very sort of directly integrated. You also, I think the reading also talked about this, but if it didn't, I'll mention it. So there was also hunting selden or partnerships, like we've talked about in a previous lecture. You would have um, people that would regularly go hunting together, and that was a pretty tight bond as well. Um, the reading mentioned, and I thought it was interesting, but then the reading also went and quickly shifted into it's not clear that this was actually the case. It's, it's not clear. But the idea of a pregnant animal taboo, basically, the idea that you shouldn't hunt pregnant animals if it can be avoided, because then there wouldn't be any animals. Um, if that actually was a traditional teaching, that's a fascinating one, because it um, really pokes a hole in a common idea. Um, some scholars, some historians feel the indigenous groups didn't intentionally practice conservation, but instead it was sort of a accidental outgrowth growth of the fact that there were small population sizes and stuff like that, and that people didn't have the technology to overexploit the environment. Things like this, which if it did exist in Denina society, and if it didn't, there are certainly other examples we could point to, and certainly a lot of other examples in a lot of other societies, uh, suggest that many indigenous groups, although it wasn't something people did all the time, certainly in some ways, at some of the time, people definitely did intentionally think about how do we uh, keep the population healthy of an animal species. Uh, as another example, um, Steve Langdon has talked about how Klingit um, fish traps 
built out of rocks, um, tidal fish traps, are built in such a way intentionally, obviously, to allow a good degree of escapement where a lot of the fish still make it through. So, intentional conservation. Um, I also have always kind of hated that term anyways, though, because it suggests that only sort of Western ways of thinking about conservation count as conservation, whereas, as we'll talk about in next lecture, there are many, many ways in which Denina society traditionally ensured that animals would continue to return and continue to be respected and therefore continue to offer themselves. We'll talk about that more next week. I'd also talked about the incredibly important relationship in the reading of dogs to hunting, uh, Lika as helping for beaver hunting, for bear hunting, for any number of different kinds of animal hunting. I find it interesting that that's kind of rooted in story as well. Peter Kalfornsky tells the story um, where he talks about the, the dog um, when the animals were dividing into pairs, right? And all the different animals found like another animal that could be its partner and nobody partnered up with the dog. So the dog basically said, fine, I'll go partner with the campfire people and I will hunt you. Um, as a result, right? I will bring them to you. So kind of in stories, it's recognized this really close relationship between dogs as hunting beings and humans as their hunting partners. There are about 20 um, land animals that the reading listed as being hunted um, by Denina people. Traditionally, we suspect the number would be higher. Most of these are for food. Um, a few of these were mainly for their fur, such as foxes or minks, right? These would have made for furs to wear. Uh, and then wolves as sort of um, a you don't want them right by your settlement kind of thing. The array of species being hunted is is fascinating. Uh, the black, brown bear, caribou, moose, mountain sheep and mountain geese, occasionally beaver, porcupines, rabbit, um, woodchuck, ground squirrels, and some of these probably multiple species would fall under that designation. Muskrat, lynx, tree squirrels, just very, very amazing. Uh, with the wolves, I thought it was interesting, the concept of that they were not eaten because they used to be people. Uh, so the ways in which people's spiritual beliefs directly influence how they hunt and why they hunt. I wanted to now share um, a couple of stories that directly relate to this land animal hunting activity. Uh, this is called Porcupine and Beaver number one and Porcupine and Beaver on the other side, both uh, told by Peter Kalfornsky. He talks about how when it was cold, Porcupine went to Brown Bear sitting in his den. By the way, this is conchi is the word for Porcupine, at least where I'm at, in the outer inlet. Spring came and Porcupine was going along and he met the campfire people. That means human people, specifically Denina human people in this story. They kept a fire. Porcupine got excited and jumped into the fire and they clubbed him. In fall, he came back to life and he was going along by a lake. Beaver was eating there. And Porcupine made... So it's, again, this idea of partnership. Beaver and Porcupine as partners. And Porcupine made a noise and Beaver jumped in the water. Porcupine said to him, Friend, it's me. How come you're afraid? Beaver said to Porcupine, You're dumb too. This winter you stayed with Brown Bear. You jumped here into the fire for the campfire people. So it's like, Porcupine, you act crazy, right? You hung out with Brown Bear. You jump into a fire in front of uh, the human people so they can hunt you. Porcupine said, That's how brave I am. To make them aware of it, I jumped into the fire for them. The campfire people club us, and it's fun for us. Um, so that is... And I think... Um, kind of a fascinating idea, right, that porcupines enjoy being clubbed, and it has been suggested, and I don't think it's unreasonable to suggest, that part of what this reflects is the fact that porcupines are very easy to club. Um, for hunting, and the reading talks about that, maybe very easy is too strong of a word, but easier than a lot of animals, um, given their speed and general temperament. And so they're relying on their quills, not on the ability to outrun, typically. And so one way to interpret that is just to say porcupines are easier to hunt. Another way to interpret that is to say that porcupines on some level enjoy being hunted. So different sorts of explanations for an ecological phenomenon that we're observing, um, which perhaps not incompatible. And then this porcupine tells a story about porcupine and mink and beaver. Um, let me see, where was the part that I want to talk about? Oh, here. I'll climb on your back, said Porcupine to Beaver. There will be a story about us. The campfire people will find out about us and what we did. When I sit on your back, you'll have no fat. As for me, I'll have no fat on my belly. So Porcupine climbed onto Beaver's back, and Beaver swam across to the willows. And Porcupine said, there will be more stories about us. They will respect your body. If you are caught, they will put your bones in the water, and you will become an animal again. That is what you said, and everything is fine with me. Um... So part of what's going on here that's interesting is that it's talking about um, the 
something we'll talk about a lot more next week or next month lecture, which is this idea of spiritual beliefs about how you dispose of animal bones. We've touched on that before. We'll talk about that more next week. But in this case, the idea that beaver bones should be put in the water to allow beavers ultimately as a species to keep resurrecting, right? To keep coming back. So that's kind of encoded into these stories. That's a little bit about spiritual beliefs and explanations, as well as traditional explanations for observed ecological behavior. There's also some business about sort of the different shapes of porcupine and beaver bodies, of course, uh, which is a lot more precise knowledge about beaver and porcupine anatomy than I have. So again, an example of traditional ecological knowledge. Um, although perhaps even a better example of this detailed knowledge of how animals behave is the way that moose were traditionally hunting, as you read about in the reading, moose were not as significant really ever as caribou. Um, there's good evidence to suggest that caribou were a lot more prominent, for example, here we're on the Kenai Peninsula historically than they are now, that moose have to some degree displaced or replaced their populations, even though they're obviously not the exact same niche. Um, but in any case, moose were hunted occasionally, and one of the ways in which the people would do this is that when wind was going this way, right, you'd come this way so that the, because the moose would smell, um, smell you, right, and run away. They'd run away from predators that they could smell you. So you go downwind um, so that they can't smell you. And then you do these, knowing that they tend to go in a line like this, um, you would do these loops so that you come up and hopefully get in front of them. Uh, if you've noticed the tracks back here, and then if you still see tracks, do another loop, right? Careful to go far away so the moose isn't seeing you. And then if you still see tracks forward, you go again, and then you note that there's not tracks anymore. And the reason is, um, according to this understanding, that moose turn back right before they want to bed down. Um, and so then you kind of do a jig jag over here, and then you can take the moose. And so that shows, um, again, a very in-depth knowledge of how moose behave that you wouldn't have if you just saw moose on a TV or something. This is people observing moose um, over, you know, months, years of their lives and coming to observations of how moose behave and then developing a hunting technique uh, that works well with that specific animal's behavior. I want to shift gears a little bit now and talk about a final topic within subsistence, which is the names for animal beings within Denina language within Denina Kanaga and some of the ways that this reflects traditional knowledge about animal beings. Uh, more so just that there are so many terms, right? An extensive array of terminology for animals and for various aspects of animals. Uh, in Jim Carrey's excellent book, The Denina Topical Dictionary, which I have here in his great book, um, he has gosh, about 45 pages of animal terms, each of which has, let's say, 10 different terms on it, 10 to 15. And some of those are for an entirely uh, species title, and some of those are like specific kinds of terms, like a seal flipper, for example. Um, but as you can see, all sorts of different terms, often it would vary by what part of, this is one of the areas where we see really clearly this example of different dialect differences that we've talked about, where a lot of times animals would either different differentiate in terms of how you pronounce, for example, with uh, Martin Kitschagusha and Kitschagusha, um, so different depending on where you're at, but also just entirely different terms, like for wolf, or so very interesting. Um, when you look at the animal nomenclature, it's been suggested, and I think it's um, right, um, by people more knowledgeable by me, but but the part of what you have is sort of a nested categorization system, uh, where basically you have, you know, term for a total type of animal, and then you have specific species terms underneath that. Uh, so for example, for humans, Denaina can be used just to mean people, uh, but also specifically to mean Denaina people, right? And the people, and then other kinds of terms used for, let's say, Atna people, Yupik people, and so forth. Um, Boris suggests that for insects, X or Gre, these traditional terms for mosquito, were oftentimes used as a more general catch-all for insects with then other smaller terms for different kinds of insects. Um, I can't say for sure, but that's what he asserts. He also asserts that Kara, the term for brown bear, one of the terms for brown bear, um, 
which you're not supposed to say too much from what I've heard for so that you're not attracting it. But anyways, that this term is then used for not just brown bear, but also for mammals in general, for large fur-bearing animals. Um, I've heard the same for salmon, but I don't, with hook-a, for sa the, the term for salmon can generally can also be used for fish generally. Uh, I've seen contradictory information on that. So at the very least, though, hook-a can be used for all salmon, and then you further distinguish between different kinds of salmon within that. Um, the bird kind of catch-all term that is used is uh, for chickadee chukarashla, which is the term for chickadee. A um, couple of interesting things about that. One, why not the bald eagle, right, or something like that? Um, one of the reasons is that Boris suggests, and I like this explanation, is that it's because um, the chickadee sticks around in the winter, right? Chickadee's kind of the little... Your little buddy that sticks around all winter. I get them in my uh, bird feeder all the time during winter, and I like seeing them. They're actually one of my favorite kinds of birds. Um, speaking of that, by the way, Chikagashla, you have winter birds, Hei Chikagashla, and summer birds, Shan Chikagashla, because, of course, here in Alaska, we have a lot of migratory birds. Uh, if you listen to that term, Chikagashla, that's not a... Um, it's an onomatopoeia for the way that bird actually sounds, as is chickadee in English. So, chickadee dee dee is the way that um, English speakers often get taught how you're supposed to do a bird call for the chickadee. But if you actually listen to what it actually sounds like, chukakashla is just as reasonable way of sort of writing down or speaking what a chickadee sounds like when it's making its calls. When you look at the different animal names, by the way, one of the things that I'm impressed by is the precision of terms even when it has zero... Um, need from a subsistence perspective. So if humans were just worried about nature from a sort of um, perspective of how we use nature, they would likely only have terms, right? Or mostly have terms for food animals. Instead, what we see, for example, with Denina language is that you have really precise terminology for animals, even when those animals have really no conceivable use from a like food perspective. Uh, so small birds are obviously a great example. If I was to tell you, hey, what's this bird, and I didn't show you um, the names, you might say a thrush if you're quite knowledgeable about birds, and then you might end the conversation there, or you might just say a songbird, or a little brown songbird. They're actually two different species, and in Denina you have terms for both, even though they're very subtly different, and I can't think of why this would be really subsistence-wise something you really needed to know, but it'd be a way of talking much more precisely about the animal beings around you, which is a form of respect, of course, to develop a more precise terminology, uh, and also a way of speaking precisely about something you find interesting. This is Kentuchila, hermit thrush, and this is Shingak, 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 Swainson, Swanson's thrush, or Swainson's thrush. Um, you see the same with chickadees. If I was to, you know, these are two different kinds of chickadees. These pictures make them look like they look really different, but a lot of times in nature, the, the differences are a little more subtle. And so a lot of times it would be natural for somebody, even if they know this is a chickadee, to just say, hey, what's this and what's this? And you just say chickadee, right? Uh, but chickadee, as we just said, is chigaga. That's for chickadee or the boreal chickadee, this guy. But then black cap chickadee, tziduk uh So again, knowledge is about having traditional ecological knowledge, having knowledge of the land, it's about more than just how you harvest food, right? That's a big part of it, but it's also about just knowing the beings around you, properly naming them, properly being able to talk about them. Uh, you can, again, see the same thing with goals. A goal, traditionally, vach is the name. I think it means, like, gray one is how it translates. If I was to ask you to name these three goals, you know, it might depend. You're Alaskans, you probably know your seagulls pretty well. Uh, but a lot of people, especially... Um, people maybe that weren't raised around as many seagulls might just say seagulls for all three of them. In reality, there are three different kinds of seagulls, and you have different names for each in Denina. So for the herring gull, this little guy with a little bit of red, um, and the yellow eye, hlikka vaja, or in other words, salmon's gull, salmon's gray one. Glockus winged gull, which look very similar. Their body shapes are slightly different. Their size is slightly different. But this picture, if anything, is probably overemphasizing the difference. They do have a different colored eye. Vach uh, and then um, Mew goal here is obviously quite a bit different. Shagala Vacha. So all of them variations of Vach, but then with a term attached. So recognition that all are seagulls and then different species names, essentially. There's also precise names to talk about animal behavior um, a lot of times, or different body parts of an animal. So for example, when it comes to seals, you can say Tabak Nakanidatli. 
to talk about a herd of seals on beach, and apologies, that was very slow, it's a very hard to pronounce word, uh, but to talk about yearling seals in a herd, so specifically seals of a certain age, bana, um, in one of the dialects it's banakak il atol i, and actually yet another dialect has a term for herd of seals when they're on a sandbar, um, so all sorts of kind of interesting things there. Some big take-homes that I want us to take as we talk about subsistence. Number one, um, that there were very specific adaptations to drawing on lots of different animal species as part of people's food. Number two, that people had very advanced technology to do this. Um, when we, if you say advanced technology and you say it to somebody on the street, they might think of a robot, a factory, a certain kind of car or jet. We should recognize, though, that every society um, across the world over, or at least the vast majority, had some kind of advanced technology that fit well in their space. It doesn't have to have fossil fuels attached to it to be an advanced technology. It doesn't have to have a computer to be an advanced technology. Uh, technology is a, it's a tool for humans and one that we have um, developed for a very specific end and developed it very well for that specific end. As we look at the different things like these um, nets, these fishing weirs, these deadfall traps, these pit traps, all these different things, we see very advanced technology, technology that's very well designed, very creatively uses existing materials in painstaking ways to get the best possible result given the materials nearby. We also, in this lecture, I think have seen really detailed knowledge, and I say both for living and for living. And what I mean by that is detailed knowledge of food animals and of how they behave, like again, the moose's behavior when it walks in a line and then turns around a little bit to bed down, but also, detailed knowledge of animals just for knowledge's sake, right? Um, Do nine of people, like many people the world over that love um, nature traditionally were, of course, very interested in the behavior of the animal beings around them and in the different animals around them and took note of it and made observation of it and encoded it into their language. So living on the land in the food sense and also just living on the land in the sense of dwelling here with these beings. I hope this was an interesting lecture for you. Um, thank you so much for your time.